Christine Taylor, and she'll speak on some equations and games in evolutionary biology. Okay, thank you. So, um, thank you, Mark. And, and uh, some time ago, uh, maybe in the fall, when uh, the member seminar was rampant with number theory talks, and <laughs> Mark was desperate seeking alternatives, so he <laughs> came to me. And, and anyway, so the, the, there, there will be very little mathematical content in the talk. We will be mostly talking about uh, group theory rather than uh, number theory. But so, so I hope you enjoy it because it's not number theory. Um, so what is evolution? I think every, even every school child has some <coughs> idea about what ev evolution is. Basically, if you have reproduction, um, uh, you will have evolution. In, in reproduction, mistakes are inevitable. So mutations are mistakes in um, information transfer in, in reproduction. And when there, when there is mutation, different messages ar uh, arise. So some messages do better, some do worse. Uh, to biologists, better means um, having more offsprings. So later in the talk, I, I'll talk about offspring qu uh, quality as well as quantity. So we all know mutation and selection are, are the key elements of uh, evolutionary change. And my goal today is to convince you that uh, cooperation is another essential a an aspect of cooperation and how game theory can be used to um, understand the evolution of cooperation. Um, so we can model using very simple mathematical models to uh, model evolution. So let's start with selection. Suppose I have n different species or phenotypes, and um, and and they evolve, and um, and individuals. Um, so y i are the different species, and their evolutionary su success depends on its fitness. So um, and the fitness basically means uh, how many offsprings they're expected to have. And in this case, we're in the simplest case, we assume fitness is constant, so it's fi. So of course, uh, if you look at the relative frequency of uh, any uh, particular species, the one with the highest fitness will dominate. And, and if, um, if you translate the differential equations from the y's to the relative frequency, the xi's, then you get this uh, selection dynamics equation, which so the rate of reproduction of i species uh, for the rel for the relative frequency is determined by the difference between the fitness and the average. The phi is the average fitness of the population. So again, the system is going to have a unique um, global equilibrium at the species with the highest fitness, and you can model um, mutation as well. So if qij are the probability of um, i, species to, uh, i species to mutate into j uh, species, then uh, this gives me my mutation uh, dynamics equation. And here, this q is a Markov matrix. And by the Perot-Frobini theorem, there's going to be a unique eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. And the phi here, the average fitness, is again 1 uh, here. And if I throw in the fitness into the equation, I'm going to get a mutation selection dynamics equation. Phi x <coughs> is the average fitness of the population. So again, it's just like the, on the previous slides, the, the relative frequency uh, of the xi's evolve according to this equation. And um, the dynamics con is completely determined by the mutation selection matrix, W. And this, uh, again, is going to have a unique global stable equilibrium. And uh, usually, mutation lowers the average fitness of the population. So, so far, we've assumed, in the simpler case, that all the fitness are constant. And, but in reality, um, the fitness should depend on who else is you're in interacting with, and also depends on the environment. So this brings us to uh, evolutionary game theory. Um, because in evolutionary game theory, we're going to assume that the fitness is no longer constant, but depends on the frequency of other strategies. So as we all know, the uh, game theory was uh, invented by a local hero, John von Neumann, in the 40s, along with uh, 
Oscar Morgenstern. And about 10 years later, another uh, local hero, John Nash, uh, introduced the concept of Nash equilibrium solution. It's a, it's a solution concept where, um, where, where no one would have an incentive to deviate uh, from his or her current strategy um, unilaterally. And 20 years later, an English uh, evolutionary bio biologist, John Maynard Smith, along with an American called George Price. I'm afraid I can't find a picture of George Price. He killed himself early, quite early in his life, and there's no reliable picture on the internet of him. So, um, they applied game theory to study animal behavior e evolutionary process. And they uh, introduced this concept, which is similar uh, to for all intents and purposes, it's similar to the Nash equilibrium strategy. So they, in biology, it's called evolutionary stable strategy. And a strategy, evolutionary stable, means um, if everyone in the population adopts this strategy, then natural selection will not let um, any other um, strategy to in invade this population is the strategy. So Nash uh, equilibrium strategy and ESS, the evolutionary strategy, are both strategies when adopted by the majority of the players in the population, um, those strategies outperform any other strategies. So in a sense, they're similar concepts. So evolutionary game theory um, relies on frequency-dependent fitness, and, but uses Darwinian principles. So everyone in the population adopts a certain strategy. Those strategies can be viewed and as certain genotypes, phenotype, or an inherited trait. <coughs> and payoff, is, payoff in this game will be um, interpreted as f fitness. So the payoff um, is going to be a linear function of the frequencies of strategies in the population. And individuals reproduce at a rate um, proportional to the to, to their payoffs. And then the ones who, the strategies that do better reproduce faster, and those who, who do the strategies that don't do so well um, re reproduce uh, slower. So that's basic Darwinian principle. Um, so because evolutionary game theory is, is just uh, uses frequency, uh, fre frequency dependent fitness, we can adapt our selection dynamics equation uh, to incorporate this uh, frequency depend fitness. So originally my, uh, the FIs were constant. Now the FIs depend on the distribution of strategies, the Xs. So everything else is the same. And the F bar is the mean uh, fitness of the population. And the F, the, so this was developed in the late 70s. So the um, fitness of the i-th strategy is a linear combination of all the other strategies. This aij is the payoff matrix. So if I have a uh, game with n, strateg n strategies, then the aij would be the n by n matrix. And my, uh, the fitness of xi would be a linear uh, function of those frequencies. Right. So let me give you an example of a game the every child plays on the schoolyard. This is a three-strategy game, rock, paper, scissors game. And you ca can write down its payoff matrix. Um, so for the simple rock, paper, scissors uh, game, all this A's, AIs, BIs should be one. Okay? So uh, rock is not evolutionarily stable against uh, paper, and paper is not evolutionarily stable against scissors, and scissors is not evolutionary stable against uh, rock. So, and if all the A's, I's are B and uh, A's and B's are one, then uh, I have one internal um, equilibrium at the point one third, one third, one third. So this, this is called replicator equations. This set of equations actually is, uh, so um, is a set of equations on n variables, but it's really on the simplex Sn. Um, in fact, it's by, you, you can transform the system into just a general Lotka-Volterra system uh, on n minus one species. 
So evolution at game theory essentially is equivalent to the lock of Volterra system in ecology. So for any payoff matrix, I can um, add a multiple uh, to each column to make all the diagonal entries zero. It doesn't alter the uh, game dynamics. So that's what I do to this um, rock, paper, scissors game. And uh, as I said, if all the A's and B's are one, then you're just going to get uh, an interior uh, equilibrium in the middle that's neutral. All your uh, solution trajectory is going to be close trajectory uh, inside this S3. And if, if the, my A's and B's are positive and this determinant of this is uh, positive, then the in internal equilibrium will be stable and the solutions will approach this interior equilibrium. And if the determinant of this matrix is positive, then the equilibrium is unstable. Anyway, turns out this, um, this game uh, appears in nature as well. About 15 years ago, um, people who study lizards discovered that um, the people who study lizards just discovered that the mating behavior of male lizards in California exhibit this rock, paper, and scissors dynamics. So there are three mating strategies for male lizards. Um, so we have, oh, very conveniently, those three ma mating strategies are distinguished by the throat color. So you know exactly <laughs> what they are. So the, the blue colored uh, lizards, they are the monogamous type. They have just one female partner, which they uh, guard very carefully. And they, in a population full of blue uh, lizards, they're going to be uh, uh, invaded by orange uh, throated lizards. Those orange throated lizards, they're the, like the alpha males, they, they keep a large territory and they keep a harem of females. And so they reproduce at a much faster rate and they're bigger and so they're more very aggressive. In a population dominated by the orange lizards, um, they're going to be under attack from the yellow throated lizards those yellow-throated lizards are small. They look and they look and behave like uh, female yellow lizards. So they they're the sneaker type. They live in the orange lizards ter uh, territory and they pretend to be females. So the orange lizards they can't notice and then they secretly uh, copulate with the partners of the orange lizards. So um, and 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 finally, in a population full of yellow. Uh, lizards, they are ineffective against the blue lizards because the blue lizards are very carefully guarding their females. There's no way they can uh, get get in and to break up the pair. So this is um, an example of this rock paper scissors game in nature. And today being Valentine's Day, it's probably very fitting to discuss the mating behavior of uh, animals. Anyway, so. So people, there's uh, uh, some biologists who spent years collecting data on the blue lizards. And here's, uh, they discovered that, so that's how they first caught on the fact, they discovered that by looking at those three types of lizard, they discovered that the morph the frequency um, of those lizards go through essentially a five year cycle. So here the color shaded region shows you which, um, which strategy is, is a, has the highest fitness in that particular region. So this is a three simplex. At this corner, everyone, uh, the whole population is yellow. And as we said, if uh, yellow is not ESS against uh, blue, so in this region, blue dominates. Blue uh, lizards have the greatest fitness. So starting from, they, they collected uh, data on the lizards for 10 years from uh, 1990 all the way to 1999 or something and discovered that there's a five-year cycle in the morph sequence. So this is the first example of rock, paper, scissors game in, in, in nature. Okay. So this is a strategy game. In general, if you have more than three strategies, the dynamics becomes much more complicated. Unfortunately, uh, for the remainder of my talk, I, I'll just concentrate on two strategy games. And the bi biologists like to say that they, 
most of the time they only care about two strategy games. If mutations are very rare, they're going to assume that the population is in a monomorphic state, so everyone's playing the strategy. And when a mutant does arise, then you only have two strategies to deal with. So we're going to concentrate the, on the two strategy uh, game. And the replicator dynamics equation shows you immediately what, I mean, this it just becomes a, a ordinary differential equation in one variable. And you see immediately what the equilibrium are, uh, solutions are. There are only three possibilities. So if the equilibrium solution is one, one is the only, uh, in this case, you have strategy A is the Nash equilibrium strategy. Um, so when one is the stable equilibrium and zero is the unstable equilibrium. And in the other case, another possibility you have uh, both A and B are best replies to itself. So this is a bistable game where uh, the payoff A is greater than C and D is greater than B. And here you have an internal equilibrium uh, point at uh, x star given by this, and that's the unstable internal equilibrium. And when the um, internal uh, equilibrium is unstable, you have, uh, is stable, you're going to have this um, uh, situation where you have a mixed Nash, a mixed Nash equilibrium strategy. So those are the three possibilities. And uh, so this, uh, so th this, the replicator dynamics uh, equation assumes the population is infinite, right? And we're interested in finding out what happens if I have a finite population. In a finite population, you see, in, uh, we talked about fitness as frequency dependent. <coughs> in a finite population, what might happen is the, the fitness will be not only frequency dependent, it will become density in, uh, dependent. It will depend on the population size too. So suppose I have n players. Um, I of them play strategy A and minus I play strategy B. Then the fitness of A and B players, are, uh, the fitness of A players when they're I A players is given by Fi. And the fitness of B players given by GI. And in the finite uh, uh, um, uh, dynamics, uh, in the stochastic dynamics, we're going to um, we're not going to, because we're not going to play against ourselves, there's a loss of fitness from not playing uh, against yourself. And this introduces interesting phenomenon that um, occurs only in finite uh, populations that, that doesn't occur in the infinite population size. So for instance, if I have, uh, in the extreme case, if I have a matrix, uh, matrix um, with, let's see, um, with this payoff matrix, in this matrix, 3 is greater than 2, 1 is greater than, is than 0. So A is the Nash equilibrium strategy. Everyone should play A. <laughs> but if I think you're playing A, I'm going to go play B, because I know I'm, I will be better off uh, than you if, I, if you're A and I'm B, because you only get 1, I get 2. And this is called the spitefulness. You, you, you add, in, in a small population, sometimes you act to lower your opponent's fitness, even at the cost of lower your own fitness, as long as you're, you're better off than uh, So that sort of thing can happen in finite uh, population. That's why we're interested in this finding out what the difference is um, in, in, in the game dynamics in the infinite population setting versus the finite population setting. So to, um, to, to model the uh, the game uh, for a finite population, we adopt a, a standard um, model called the Moran process. In the Moran process, you keep the total population size constant at n. So at each time step, you choose two people, uh, one for uh, elimination, one for reproduction. You choose the one for reproduction according to their fitness. And then you choose a random person to um, for elimination. So an identical offspring from uh, the one who was chosen for reproduction replaces the one who is eliminated. So the result is a, a Markov process that's quite simple. It's a tri-diagonal Markov process, uh, process. 
the only non-zero entries are on the diagonal and just above and below the diagonal. So either at each time step, either i is the number of a player, it either goes up by one if an a player is chosen for reproduction and the b player is chosen for elimination, or the number goes down by one, or if it remains the same, it's just um, so this is a simple Markov process, and uh, this Markov process has lots of nice properties, and it's easy, much easy, it makes calculation much easier. And often, there's uh, in population genetics, people use the Wright Fisher model, uh, which is more complicated. It's another Markov process where, at each time step, you kill off everyone in the population, and at the next stage, the frequency of A players will be a binomial, binomial random variable with the probability p given by the um, relative fitness of a in the previous round. But uh, it, it's, um, it, it's harder to do calculations with Wright-Fisher process than with the Moran process. So we're interested in, given the Moran process, we're interested in um, under what conditions a strategy can in, uh, a particular strategy can invade or take over a population. So how, how, when can a mutant invade or take over a resident population? So xi are the uh, fixation probabilities of strategy A when there are initially i A players in the population. So xi satisfy this recurrence equation. And because my Markov process was, uh, the Moran process is so nice and simple, <coughs> uh, we can very easily calculate the fixation probabilities. And we're mainly interested in the fixation probability of a single mu mutant. So row AB is a prob uh, fixation probability of a single A in a population of all Bs, and row BA is a, is a fixation probability of a single B in all A. Um, so this, this gives us the rate of evolution for a mutant in the resident population, and it should depend on the population size. In the simplest example, when um, the resident population has fitness 1 and A has constant fitness, say, K, you can calculate the fixation probabilities very easily. And uh, in the case of a neutral mutant, when K equals 1, then the fixation probability is just going to be 1 over n. And we're going to, uh, we, we're going to call a uh, mutant, say, A, advantageous when the fixation probability of a single A mutant is greater than 1 over n, 1 over n greater than, the, than a, mut a neutral mutant. We're not, saying, we're not saying A is advantageous when A's fixation probability is greater than 1 half. We're only comparing with the neutral mu mutant. The, yeah? Oh, so if I have a Moran process, right, and this Moran process, two uh, absorbing states at, at z zero and n. So if you start with, say, two A players in a population of, of 10 B players, eventually with this Markov process, it's going either going to all B or all A. Yeah. So I want to find the probability of, uh, you, get you get to all, all A. And, and that shows my mutant. That gives me a, a measure <coughs> on, on the probability of my mutant taking over the population. So, and, uh, so we're interested in comparing any mutant with a uh, neutral mutant, because uh, in, in the 70, 60s and 70s, and population geneticists came up with uh, championed the theory that um, <coughs> it's called neutral theory of molecular evolution. It's Essentially, all the um, genetic mutations one observe uh, confer little, if any, uh, fitness advantages. Um, and they're usually fixed in a population through random drift rather than through fitness advantage. Uh, advantage. The reason being, so, uh, mutate genes that have been optimized for millions and millions of gen uh, generations, it's extremely hard for a, 
uh, a new mutation to occur with some sort of fitness advantage. So that's why we're mainly interested in comparing mutants with neutral mutants. Uh, uh, neutral mutants. Um, so, so the random, uh, if you just, I mean, if A and B have the same fitness and you throw an A into a B, then the chance of A, uh, the problem going from 1A to all A is essentially 1 over N. It's just random, random drift. So this, for this, uh, is the, the, for this stochastic discrete uh, uh, Markov process, if you take the limit when N, if you let N goes to uh, become very large and let the, um, um, uh, sorry, the, 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 the fitness, um, uh, the, the selection uh, strength become very small, then, then my initial Moran process is going to approach, oops, is going to, uh, uh, can be approximated by this diffusion process. Oops. And then you can, uh, Calculate. So here the UXI, then you can do lots of calculations on the fixation probabilities and time to fixation too. So UXI is the probability of uh, strategy A fixating in a population when the initial frequency of A is X. And uh, so you can calculate fixation probability. In particular, you can approximate the fixation probability of a single A mutant. And uh, you can calculate the fixation times too. And this Moran process is a um, it's a reversible process. It satisfies this thing called uh, detailed balance condition. So it's it's very nice. has a ha has a property that the time to fixation of a single A mutant in an all B uh, population is the same as the fixation time of a single B mutant in an all A population regardless of the game, what, the, what my uh, game is, what my payoff matrix is, regardless of the strength of selection. Um, but th this is not the case in, um, for, for uh, Wright Fisher process. We do have an interesting result. Um, suppose I have a game which both A and B are, are both are Nash in the case, then I want to know what, what, what are the prob uh, I want to know whether A uh, can fixate in the all B population better than a neutral mutant. And instead of calculating the fixation probability, it turns out that all you need to calculate is to decide whether this inequality holds. So if this inequality holds, then I, I can say that the, in the stochastic dynamics, the fixation probability of A is greater than 1 over N. So A is better than a neutral mutant. And this inequality basically says the fitness of A at uh, fitness of A is greater than the fitness of, the fitness of B at the frequency when the frequency of A is one third. So <coughs> in other words, another way to say this is you look at the internal unstable equilibrium. If the when n is very large, if the uh, uh, internal equilibrium is less than one third, then uh, I know that the, in, the in the stochastic Moran process, this A is going to uh, be able to take over the resonant population better than a neutral mutant. And that's not if and not if? Sorry? That's not insufficient. Yeah. Uh, I mean, how far is it from? Uh, no, I, 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 uh, the, no, 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 this is if and only if. Okay. Yeah, it's only if and only if. Okay. So this, so 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 far, I've talked about um, how to use game theory to calculate various uh, fixation probabilities. So now I get to the part where I said I want to talk about cooperation. So um, I, how cooperation is an essential aspect of evolutions. So cooperation is all around us. It's something that humans do. Birds and bees do it. The plants do it. And, and even bacteria and uh, viruses cooperate. So here are some examples. And I'll talk about fish uh, later in the talk. And uh, here's monkeys groom each other. And 
uh, bees are a popular example. The worker bees spend their whole lives defending a ter uh, their, the beehive and raising the offspring of a queen bee. Yeah. And I don't know if this is clear to this is those are meant to be penguins. So if you've seen the documentary a few years ago called March of the Penguins, you know the penguins who um, they breed and spend the winter on the permanent ice sheet. And the male penguins have a particularly hard time because they look out to the egg first while the females go get food, build up reserve. And when the female comes back to take over the egg, the male, it's ma the male's turn to go to the open sea to feed. And by the time the females come back, they've essentially lost half of their body weight because they have no shelter out in the cold. There's no, no food, no shelter. There's, it's in the Arctic, Antarctic <coughs> winter. So and then they face a long march to the open sea to feed. And uh, usually it's 50 to 100 miles to the, to the sea. And normally, the penguins are very territorial. They don't approach each other. But on this long march, the only way they can survive in this cold when they have very little energy, reserve energy left, is that they form this huddle. So by forming this huddle, you see the penguins inside are sheltered from the wind. And this huddle moves slowly across the ice sheet and get them to the, that's the only way they can survive. And also interesting, the, the penguins on the outside are always switching position. They're constantly shifting position with the penguins on the inside, so everyone gets a turn to stay warm for, for, for a little bit. And um, so cooperation is not just restricted to um, sentient beings. In fact, bacteria huddle too. Bacteria uh, huddle by forming this thing called the bacteria. Uh, uh, a biofilm, which is basically uh, a, 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 dense, uh, packly a densely packed community of bacteria, and they surround themselves with polymers both for nutrient acquisition and for protection. And the formation of biofilm uh, makes the bacteria much more resistant to antibiotics. So, um, and here's a picture of uh, this thing called a social amoeba. It's a very simple sing single celled life form. Usually they <coughs> live solitary, uh, they live in the soil. And when their bacterial uh, food source um, gets scarce, um, the social amoeba, they come together, they form a multicellular slug. They, they move toward the surface of the soil, and about a quarter of the uh, slime mold. They form this dead stalk to hold up the spores on top for long distance dispersal. So the, this, the spores on the top <coughs> are held up by the stalk, and then they, um, they can, the spores can be uh, dispersed further away to, to get nutrients. To get. So, so those are, um, you know, I showed you the lizards, and you collect data on lizards for 10 years, and even then the data doesn't look so nice. So, which is why these days people would rather use study bacteria and, and viruses, because it, with the advance in technology, it's much easier to study, to do experiments in a petri dish than to go out to collect, um, collect actual data about animals. Um, So, say so cooperation is all around us, but it's, it, it's an enigma because according to Darwinian principles, um, you know, only this usually selfish strategy is the best strategy. So how na uh, evolution could uh, design such, a, such cooperative and altruistic behavior is, is uh, an enigma. And, um, our goal is to use ev evolutionary game theory to study the evolution of cooperation. So cooperation usually, so I want to describe cooperation in, 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 in the game theory. Usually <coughs> cooperation comes in two flavors. This is the altruistic uh, uh, flavor, which says a cooperator pays a cost C um, to yield a benefit 
for the uh, for the recipient B, and the, uh, the the cooperator itself does not receive any benefit. So when the two cooperators meet, then they each receive payoff B minus C, and if for one defector meets a cooperator, then the defector is much better off. And two defectors, when they meet, uh, they receive nothing. Right. This is also known as a prisoner's dilemma game, which, you know, suppose uh, <laughs> Sophie and I are both suspected for <laughs> some drug deal or something, and the police doesn't have enough <laughs> evidence to com <laughs> to, to to uh, convict us, so they put us in separate cells and offer us a deal. It says, look, if you testify against the other person, then you'll walk free. So if Sophie testifies against me, then she walks free and I, and I get 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, if we both testify <coughs> against each other, then we each get five years. Um, but if we both say no, the other person is innocent, then there's not much they can do. They'll just give us a ticket for speeding or something like that. Yeah. So in that case, in, in the prison asylum game, you're always, whatever your opponent does, you're al always better off defecting. But then defec uh, this defecting is not a uh, Pareto optimal strategy. You're, we're both better off by cooperating. So the other flavor of cooperation is uh, mutualistic flavor. In that case, the benefit is <coughs> available to the uh, donor as well as the recipient. So, and the cost is shared between the two uh, cooperators. So this is also known as hog duff game or chicken game. This is the game that John Maynard Smith and George Price studied first when they um, wanted to use game theory to understand animal behavior. And uh, it's also called snowdrift game. So in this, the way you think about this game is if, say, there's an enormous snowdrift in the middle of Einstein Drive, and you have two cars coming down in opposite directions, and, and they hit this uh, snowdrift. So the drivers can either get out of the car to shovel or stay in the car. And basically, you want to do what the the opposite of whatever the other guy's doing. If the other guy's shoveling, you might as well stay in the car. But if the other guy's not shoveling, you better get out. So in this game, um, neither C or D are, are Nash uh, or ESS. So the Nash equilibrium is a mixed, uh, we have a mixed Nash equilibrium strategy. And this is also a, um, this is also a, a, a cooperative dilemma game because at the mixed Nash equilibrium strategy, the mean population payoff is lower than it would be if everyone cooperated. So those are the two types of cooperative dilemma games we encounter. So you, and, and, and as we said here, it's not obvious how uh, cooperation can arise. Um, Cooperation needs help. Uh, uh, evolution, uh, for cooperation to evolve, uh, you need there are various mechanisms. So uh, people have come up with theories of king selection. So usually, if like the bees, if the bees are related, the worker bees are related to the queen bees, then they're willing to uh, forego their reproductive cost to raise the queen bees' children because they're siblings. And there, there are various other mechanisms like spatial reciprocity and group selection. But I'm going to focus on um, direct reciprocity. So what's direct reciprocity? Basically, uh, this is, uh, was first um, proposed by Robert Trivers, who's a um, social biologist at Rutgers. He's a very colorful <laughs> individual. And some, sometimes I'll tell you guys about his stories at lunch. So he came up <laughs> with the term reciprocal altruism. Basically said if there are repeated encounters between the same individuals, then direct reciprocity can emerge and can lead to the evolution of cooperation. So the best way to study reciprocity, the best uh, 
paradigm for studying uh, recipro uh, direct reciprocity is um, you, it is um, uh, due to Robert Axelrod, who, who is a political scientist at the University of Michigan. And in the late 70s, he conducted a computer tournament uh, on what the best strategy is in a repeated prisoner's dilemma game. So in a regular prisoner's dilemma game, you're always better off uh, defecting. But if in a prisoner's dilemma, it's a repeated prisoner's dilemma game, it's not clear what the best strategy is. So he invited people all over the world to submit their favorite, their best strategy. And uh, this tournament was con conducted twice. And in both rounds of the tournament, uh, a very simple strategy uh, was the winner. This is the uh, strategy proposed by a game theorist. It's called tit for tat. What it does is basically, in the tit for tat strategy, cooperate in the first round, and then repeats the move of the opponent from the previous. Uh, uh, so in the first round, you cooperate. And then thereafter, you copy the move of your opponent in the previous round. So, um, and tit for tat, um, they, so for the tit for tat strategy, they never gain <coughs> more than the opponent. On the other hand, if in the, in the tournament, they always do, they do much better against any strategy, uh, say, than a, than a given strategy, say, x than any other strategy y can receive from x. So it's always the winner. The, yeah? So in, in this tournament, you are paired successively with you each of the other Oh, players. so you, you play, so it's a, suppose there are about 100 different strategies. So each strategy is played with all 99 other strategies. And then you add up the payoffs, and then you choose the winner that way. So the, the trouble with tit for tat uh, strategy is that it's um, if there is a mistake of when two tit for tat players encounter each other, if there's a slight mistake, then the two of them are going to be locked in defection for the rest of the game. So tit for tat is uh, is. Uh, somehow unforgiving. It's not, it doesn't tolerate mistakes. And later on, there's a different strategy called win, stay, lose, shift. Basically, it says if you're doing well, stay with your current strategy. If you're doing, not, uh, you're doing badly, then you switch to the other strategy. That strategy is more robust. So we can look at the payoff matrix to <coughs> understand um, the repeated prisoner's dilemma. This is a standard prisoner's dilemma game where the T is the payoff for the defector. The temptation of defection is greater than the reward of cooperation and greater than punishment for the two defectors and greater than the sucker's payoff for the cooperator against the defector. So, and if we, for a repeated prisoner's dilemma game, I consider two strategies, tit for tat versus all D. So all D is you just defect at every single round. So. For in a repeated prisoner's uh, dilemma game, suppose I tell you with, with probability you, I, this, we're going to have another round. So on average, I expect to have n rounds, where n is 1 over 1 minus u. So if n is large enough, then the tit for tat will become uh, ESS, will become Nash. Right? So in, in, in the replicator dynamics for the infinite population size, if n is large enough, um, then this be, uh, the tit for tat becomes uh, ESS. And so if the initial uh, frequency of tit for tat is greater than this equilibrium strategy level, then everyone will become cooperator. If the initial frequency of tit for tat is lower, then everyone will play all D. And, but in the stochastic dynamic setting, um, we said, oh, if we want to know whether a single tit for tat player can behave better than a neutral mutant against all D, all you need to check is whether the XC, the unstable equilibrium, has, uh, is, is, less, uh, is less than one third or not. So for instance, for the 
this rock, uh, for, for this prisoner dilemma game. Um, if I have, uh, this is uh, for a population size of 100, as long as you play the, and the x-axis is the number of rounds, the game is repeated. As long as you play the game more than six times, you know that the, your tit for tat will be better than neutral mutant. But in the deterministic dynamics, if you have a population and you say initially only 1% of the population is cooper uh, cooperators or tit for tat players, then it takes 51, over 50 rounds for, um, for you to be guaranteed that, that the tit for tat, the cooperators, will take over the whole population. <coughs> and we said the stochastic dynamics depends on the population size. So here's in the picture the green curves gives you the uh, rate of fi uh, fixation of a single tit-for-tat player in the OD population. So for an intermediate ra range of the population size n, so the x-axis is n, uh, we know that tit-for-tat strategy I is advantageous. But if the population size is very large or very small, then, um, then, then they don't do better than a neutral mutant. So um, here's a proof of how direct reciprocity really works in, 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 in real world. So this is my favorite experiment uh, done by Manfred Milinsky uh, to illustrate direct reciprocity. So here's, uh, he studied fish. So you, uh, little fish, those fish, uh, stickleback fish, they inspect um, predators usually in pairs. They go in a pair to approach this uh, cichlid uh, uh, as a predator fish. They check out the predator, make sure, and, and they do this together. So usually one fish goes slightly ahead of the other, and each forward move representing, represents a cooperative, um, behavior, a co a cooperative strategy. Uh, and then your partner is supposed to either follow you or your partner might run away. If the partner is running backwards, then that represents defection. So, so to understand how the two, how, how, how the two fish coordinate this um, predator inspection behavior, he set up this tank and you just put one fish in there and you, you have put, there are two settings for the mirror. There's the cooperative mirror setting and the defective <laughs> the mirror setting. You just move the mirrors along, around to fool the fish into thinking your partner is either cooperating or defecting. And then you see what it does. Right? And then turn out, in whatever you do <laughs> to the mirrors, those fish always adopt this tip for tat strategy when they approach the, um, the, the, the um, predator. And uh, so, and, and let me come back to the lizards again. So, for the, so I talked about the male lizards. They have three phenotypes and co with corresponding genotypes. And, and for the female lizard, there turned out there are only two types. They're, the ori uh, they're either yellow colored or orange colored. The yellow colored uh, female lizards, they um, produce a, a small, uh, they have a small clutch size, so they have fewer babies, but each, uh, each egg they produce is, is bigger. And whereas the orange lizards, they have uh, lots of babies, but each baby is smaller. So, and so of course, the, 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 now this, my, um, the lizards, if you try to model it using game theory, I had, so far we've talked about frequency dependent fitness. And here, the, the, is the, the yellow lizards are, are favored when the population density is very high. So if there are lots of uh, lizards and food is scarce, then the, the, the offspring of the yellow lizards who are, who are endowed with more egg mass, they're going to survive better than, um, than the orange babies who are smaller to start with. So here is a case where my game, my game payoff matrix is going to change according to the um, population size. So the game is density dependent. 
not only is the fitness frequency dependent, but the game itself is density de uh, dependent. And uh, again, the same people who collect data on lizard who discovered the uh, rock, paper, scissors dynamics in male lizard discovered that there is a two-year cycle in the morph frequency uh, of uh, female lizards, which coincides with a two-year cycle in the population of lizards. So here, the boom years actually means, so the shaded uh, parts of the boom years means that when the population size is low, the population size is going to boom in the next year. So in those, at that, uh, the boom, in, in the boom years, because the population size will grow, you're better off having uh, yellow babies than orange babies. In the crash years, when the population size in the following year is going to decrease, you're better off having orange babies um, because they're, they're going to survive just as well when the population density is low. Okay. So the, this, um, the, uh, the, the lizard, the female lizards, played this offspring quantity versus quality game. And it's an example of uh, direct reciprocity in, in ecology. So originally I said that the, the most naive notion of fitness is should be, uh, depends on the number of offsprings one can have. In fact, it should depend on the, pro the number of surviving offsprings. So if you, if, um, you let, um, if a parent has resource R and the parent gives birth to N babies and S is the probability of survival given this amount of resource, then the fitness should really depend on the product of N times the probability of survival of the babies. So we're going to study how, so, so animals have a huge range of clutch sizes. Some, and it's always a puzzle why some animals have lots of babies and some animals have uh, only one or two babies. So um, we want to study how, th um, what's the optimal cl uh, clutch size in any environment. So this is a, a model that illustrates how the an optimal clutch size should be, depend on the time scale of evolution. And it's also an example of direct reciprocity. So here I have, suppose I have two uh, genetically determined clutch size, NH and NI. So NH is, is bigger than NI. So NH are the orange female lizards, and NI correspond to the yellow female lizards. And the, 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 the um, NH ones correspond to the, we call them spenders because uh, and NI call, uh, called investor because you invest more, more in your offspring and then you in, it represents an investment in the future. So, and uh, I assume uh, asexual uh, uh, reproduction where there's only a single reproductive event, where there's no overlapping generations and the resource level is stabilized uh, in one generation. Then there are four possible categories. So suppose the mother is an investor then the child of the mother was probably one of a, one minus mu is going to be another investor who stays in this category and was probably mu is the baby is going to become a spender. And the spender inherits a large resource level, but in the next re in, in the next reproduction, the spender was probably one minus mu is going to give um, uh, have babies who are spender again, and they're going to have smaller resource level, and with probably mu, the baby will become revert to investor, and, and then uh, with, uh, because uh, inherits the uh, resource level of a uh, spender parent, so this is IH. There are four categories in this mutation selection model. This is a discrete mutation selection model. And if you run simulation on this and you analyze the mutation se selection dynamics, it turns out that if you look at those four quantities, if those four quantities satisfy the conditions we have for the prisoner's dilemma game with 
t is greater than r, greater than p, greater than s. And if the mutation is large enough, then there are more spenders than investors in a population. So a faster, this shows that the faster evolutionary change favors spenders to uh, investors. So the investors somehow invests, cooperates with the future, and, and, and they are a good long-term strategy with the, inv uh, sorry, the, the investors invest in the future, and they're a better long-term strategy, and uh, whereas the stem spenders are a better short-term strategy. Okay. So this is assuming uh, that we have uh, uh, just a single reproductive event and non-overlapping <coughs> generation. Uh, not overlapping generations. And so I started looking at this since last fall. I suppose we want to generalize to a continuous model where you have, um, we want to find the optimal strategy, uh, the optimal clutch size n uh, for, uh, we, we, and want to also somehow we want to find the optimal ba balance between um, reproduction and, and survival. So we're going to assume in the continuous model that reproduction occurs uh, all the time, and the, the population, the gener you ha you're going to have overlapping generations. So the way to understand this is you look at the population density function, which is going to evolve um, according to the age uh, A, and X is the resource level, or X. And, um, and, and, and if you, so T is the time. So we want to see how the population uh, structure evolves with age and resource at time T. Mu is the rate of death. So in the simplest case, suppose I let the size evolve with constant rate, and I say at any given time, I devote R proportion of my resource to uh, reproduction. And turns out the population, uh, for, uh, uh, follows this partial differential equations, and the initial condition and the boundary condition, this is the initial condition that tells you what happened in the, at time t equals zero, and the boundary condition is, uh, tells you how many babies uh, uh, at time t I, 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 I have. So uh, at time t, this, the babies of size x comes from parents with size n over r times x. So Eve was helping me in the fall with <laughs> this, this, this uh, solving this equation. You can solve this equation, and here the h is, uh, is, is a function that tells you how long it takes for, a, how the time it takes for, for the size to evolve from birth size to a particular size x. You can solve this. And then um, you plug it into the, my, the boundary condition, then I'm going to get a general renewal equation. And with the first term depends on what happens at the, the initial population, and the second times is the crucial time. So if when t, we're only interested in what happens when t is very large. When t is very large, this term is, is zero. So I get a homogeneous uh, renewal equation. And uh, so this renewal equation depends on, on the size. In fact, this, if size is not an issue, this is a very classical problem that was solved by Lotka in the 20s. And maybe even Euler had this equation called euler lotka equation. Maybe even Euler has contributed to solving it. The idea is the same. Basically, when T of is very large, the solution approaches my solution, so if x is not there, the solution is just going to e to the lambda dt. Lambda d gives you the growth rate of the population size. And if you, with size involved, what you're really looking at is this uh, operator. This is going to be a, a, a compact operator on the positive cone of the L1 space. And in the simplest examples, if my mutation rate is constant, you can find that, so as Eve was telling me, that this operator is going to, by the Kran-Ruttman uh, theorem, 
it's going to, you're going to find this lambda d is going to be the eigenvalue with the greatest real part. And the corresponding eigenvector is positive. That gives you, me the distribution of the size of the resource level. So when t is very large, my solution is going to look like this. And as I said, for in the simplest case, um, my, the, the, the norm of my operator f, f at lambda is, going to, is given by this. And what's this expression? This expression is uh, closely related to this R0. R0 is defined the net reproductive rate. Basically, it's the number of offsprings you're expected to have in your lifetime. So if R0 is greater than 1, th then this lambda d is going to be uh, positive. Uh, if R0 is less than 1, then the population will shrink. So, but in general, for, an, uh, for a general de uh, death rate, it's very difficult to calculate what this, the, uh, what the, to come up with the expression for f of lambda d. And, but the, 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 the principle remains is that if you know the eigenvector, then you just calculate this and you look at the net reproductive rate. So, I want to end by thanking the people who taught me everything. And I also want to quote this quotation from, I learned from Bambieri's talk uh, in the fall about the inadequacies of applied mathematics. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Yep.